We've all got brains and we're built for mathematics. So turn yours on and get ready for... Mike Drop Maths! That's right, you heard us, maths. I, Mrs. Wells Corfield, in my class, loves mathematics. Maths isn't just about adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. That's why we have yes. There's so much more to it. This first episode of Mike Drop Maths, you'll learn all about our adventure with classifying numbers as even or odd, or prime or composite. Without further ado, let's start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. You get the idea. All the numbers we just counted are natural numbers. Natural numbers are the counting numbers starting at one. Sorry, zero, you're just not natural. Naturally, we were wondering, are there other ways to classify numbers? It turns out, there are other ways to classify numbers. First, we investigated evens and odds. The whole class thought they knew everything they needed to know about evens and odds. Two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? Even numbers, even numbers, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> then I gave them some counters and asked students to prove it, and they stared blankly. They were waiting, hoping, expecting that I would tell them what to do with the counters on their desk. Ha! No way! They had to turn to a friend and talk it out. How I can show a number is even or odd. What do you think they did? Can you picture the counters in your head? Our counters were red and yellow chips. If you don't have counters at home or in your class, you can use Cheerios or paper clips or pennies. How would you move them to show even or odd? Eventually, through trial and error, because we are never afraid to try, try, and try again, they discovered that to create an even number, you can put the counters in groups of two without any remainders. Sometimes we call the remainder a leftover. Have you ever had an even number of classmates? In that class, all students have a partner. No one feels left out or has to get stuck in a group of three. Even numbers are cool like that. Everyone is included. So what would an odd number look like then? Hmm. Well, even numbers make perfect partners. That's why all even numbers are divisible by two. Even the number zero. Think about it. Does zero have any remainders or someone without a partner? Nope. We thought it was pretty interesting to find out why all even numbers can be divided by two. They can be put in pairs. A pair is two. Have you ever wondered how you can look at a number and know if it was even? Well, just look at the digit in the ones place. If it's even, you can bet your bottom dollar so is that number. Odd numbers though, they're a different story. Take a number like unlucky 13. Go ahead, put 13 counters in front of you. You can make six pairs with your counters, but then one lonely counter is remaining, sitting on your desk with no counter friends. Poor leftover counter. Even worse, since two is not a factor of odd numbers, it's not divisible by two either. We felt kind of sad for that leftover counter, so we wanted to help it out. How can I help that lonely counter? How can I help him find a pair? It turns out, if we took an odd number of counters, like five, and grouped it with another odd number of counters, like three, the two leftovers could buddy up and everyone would have a partner. Yay! Problem solved. Were there other ways to help that lonely counter? Well, we joined an even group with another even group. What do you think happened? Think about it, even plus even. Or picture this, two counters plus two counters. Well, they started even and they stayed even. Things were looking nice and tidy on our desks. The sum of an odd plus odd was even and the sum of an even plus an even made an even. You know what though? It didn't work out that way when we added odd plus even. Turns out, the sum of an odd number and an even number is an odd number. Ugh! That remainder started by himself and stayed by himself because that even number didn't have any partners to spare. We had a feeling, because of the commutative property, you know, you can add two numbers or multiply two numbers in any order, that the same would be true if we added an even plus odd. We were right. The only way to make an even number is to add even plus even or odd plus odd. This was true no matter what size number we tried, and boy, did we try them. 
Now, my students are curious, as all mathematicians should be, and they started wondering. What would happen if we started multiplying even numbers and odd numbers? Would their products be even or odd? Do you think I was going to stop that kind of questioning? Not a chance. But before we go any further into multiplication, I'd like to introduce you to my friends the terms product and factors. They're helpful to know if you want to speak like a mathematician. Why, hello there. My name is Product. I think I'm the first product that's ever been on a podcast. I never would have had this honor without my friends Factor and Factor. I'm the result of them. Ah, oh, shucks. Thanks, Product. Yeah, thanks, Product. It's always our pleasure. Like I said, my name is Product, and I'm pretty well known. See, I'm the number you get when numbers are multiplied together. That's what I was trying to say. I really wouldn't be here today as the product that I am without my friends Factor and Factor. It's true. Multiplying us, Factors, makes a product. I love that I get to hang out with you, Factor. And I love being with you, Factor. And when you multiply us together, you get a product. There you have it. A behind the scenes look at how I, product, came to be who I am today. I could not have done it without the help of these two factors. Now that you've met my friends, the terms product and factors, you're ready to get back to the classroom. What would start happening to these even and odd numbers when we started multiplying them together? Hmm, let's see. They started multiplying evens by evens and odds by odds, and you know what? They were quite surprised with the results. An even number multiplied by an even number was still an even number, and an odd number multiplied by an odd number was still an odd number. Well, that's different than when we were adding odd numbers. As my daughter would say, what in the world? Why is an even number times an even number even? Why is an odd number times an odd number an odd number? What do you think? You can pause any time you'd like to draw some pictures, talk with a friend, or just think. This was way too much to memorize. We just wanted to make sense of it. Then we could always use reasoning to remember what we learn later. Let's make connections to what we already know about multiplication. We can show multiplication in arrays, or rows and columns. Let's try three an odd number times four, an even number. Now the students were showing three times four by creating three rows of four counters on their desks. Make that mental image in your math's mind. Got it? No? That's okay. Draw a picture or move some counters. Hit pause. We can wait. Then, can we show four rows of three instead of Three rows of four? Someone's always got to be different. What do you think I said? Heck yes. You're technically modeling four times three, but the product will be the same. Because of, yep, good old commutative property of multiplication. We can always, I repeat always, multiply two numbers in any order. This is a math law. So sure, show the rows any way you want. Either way, they were modeling an even number times an odd number by building arrays. Now, my fifth graders decided to count them all up to find the product. And what do you think they got from their 3 times 4 array? 12! Boom! An even number! An odd number times an even number was even! They did it again with an odd number times an even number, and it was still true. Odd times even makes an even. You know their wheels were spinning now. What if is our favorite question, followed closely by why. Nothing makes me happier than when my class is asking questions. That's when I know they're really learning. What if multiplied an even number times an even number? Let's make two rows of six or six rows of two. Twelve. That's even too. Okay, okay. So are we always going to get an even number when we're multiplying, or what? Wait we decided to try one more option, the only one left. We decided to multiply an odd number by an odd number. Any predictions? We made five rows of three. Ooh wee, look at that, 15. It was odd. The only way 
to make an odd product is if both factors were odd. Otherwise, it's always even Stevens. How am I ever going to remember all of this? Well, like I said earlier, we can always draw pictures to find answers in maths. We can also think about what just makes sense. Revisit those counters until you're nice and familiar. Whoa, I could see the light bulbs going off above each of their heads. Any multiplication problem that had even number as a factor gave us an even product. Only when we had all odd factors did we have an odd result. That makes sense. Even numbers are always, and I really mean always, divisible by two. If one of the factors in the multiplication problem is even, then the product will be even. I think it's time for our first season's first mic drop. That is some cooler than cool mathematics right there. Oh yeah. And now I think I can finally introduce you to my good friends, the terms even and odd. Hello, I'm even, and this is my friend, Odd. Hey, 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 I'm odd. Like, really odd. So I heard you wanted to get to know me. The first thing to know about me, Miss Even Number, is to be me, you must be a whole number that is divisible by two. Want to know how I'm so loved? I'll tell you, it's because anytime you're working with me, you always have a friend. Some examples of me, the even number, are 0, 2, 8, 12, and 20. I can also be a big number like 3,456 or 1,234,216. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody loves the evens. I'm odd, so I'm not divisible by two. But you know what? It's cool to be different sometimes. Maybe I want to work on my own and not always have to be paired up. And you know what else? If you group two odds together, you can make an even number. So two odd numbers can be combined to make an even. I can be small like one, or I can be big like 125,415. Look at the digits in my ones place and you'll recognize me right away. Thanks for having us. If you're having a hard time telling us apart, just look at our ones place. If the digit in our ones place is divisible by two, you've got me, even. If not, you're with my friend, Odd. Thanks, Even and Odd. We're so glad you could make it. That was a lot of brain power. So let's let Mills and Hudson take over with a few math laughs. I got into a fight with one, three, five, seven, and nine. What happened? The odds were against me. <laughs> hey Mills. Yeah? How do you make seven an even number? How? Take out the S. <laughs> you know it's odd? What? Every other number. <laughs> Two is the only even prime number. Really? Odd, isn't it? Nice ones, Hudson. Surely there can't be more ways to classify numbers, right? I mean, we already classified them as natural or not natural and even or odd. What else can we do with these numbers? So, we did what we do when we want to understand something in math. We picked up our pencils and became mathematical artists. We started outlining squares on grid paper. Here in room 25, we find it helpful to use grid paper to keep us nice and organized. What do we draw? Numbers! We outlined one plain box. It had no bells or whistles. It did have one edge on the side and one edge on the top. That told me its factors were one and one. Huh, that's weird. The number one only has one factor, itself. You know kids, they didn't want to stop at one. They wanted to go bigger, so we kept going. They asked me if they should outline the next number, two, like a hot dog or a hamburger. No. I like to speak like a mathematician, and I'm vegetarian. So I asked them to exchange the word hot dog for horizontal, and hamburger for vertical. And as a treat for upgrading their vocabulary, I told them they could draw it either way. Because no matter how they drew their rectangle, one side would be outlining two box edges, and the other side would be outlining one box edge. Drawing it horizontally or vertically was simply rotating the same rectangle. The number two, was different than the number one, because yes, it was still just one rectangle, but it had two unique factors, one and two. The same thing happened when they drew the number three on grid paper. It only had one rectangle, and one side had three box edges outlined, and the other side 
only outlined one edge. Then we got to four, and you know what? Hands were shooting up in the air like fireworks on the 4th of July. That's because students discovered they could draw two different rectangles for the number four. They could outline a rectangle with two box edges by two box edges, or a rectangle with four box edges by one box edge. Because we were able to draw two different rectangles for the number four, we were able to identify more than two factors. The factors of four were one and four and two. We kept going with this for a while. Five only had one rectangle, six had two rectangles. We kept going. Feel free to hit pause and go on your own journey outlining rectangles for more numbers. How many factors can you find for each number? How many rectangles can you make for each number? Wait, can we classify numbers by the numbers of factors they have? Well, since you asked, I'd like to tell you the story of Eratosthenes. That's right, Eratosthenes. Kids, can you say that name again for me? Is Eratosthenes? Eratosthenes? Eratosthenes. <laughs> e e o Eratosthenes. Now, Eratosthenes was born in 276 BCE in Libya, and he died 194 BCE in Egypt. If you're looking for these countries on a map, they can both be found in Africa, but that map would have looked a lot different back in Eratosthenes' day. Now, get this. Eratosthenes was a Greek astronomer, scientific writer, geographer, mathematician, and poet. I'd say he was a man with a curious mind and many interests. He's most famous for making the first measurement of the size of the Earth. I just love that before telescopes, before the moon landing, before a Mars rover, there was a human who was trying to figure out just how big his home planet was. Why are we talking about Eratosthenes in this episode? Because he also worked on prime numbers. He is remembered for his prime number sieve, which people all over the world now finally call the sieve of Eratosthenes. A sieve is a fancy one-syllable word that means simply to sift out, to find what you're looking for. This sieve is like a prime number treasure hunt. Want to know something cool? A modified version of his sieve from way, way back when is still an important tool in number theory research today. That's quite an amazing mathematical discovery, and we, young mathematicians in the glorious state of Virginia, Use that very sieve to begin our investigation into the world of prime numbers. We just had to make our own sieve after we learned all about Eratosthenes, so I gave each student a chart with the numbers 1 through 100, a hundreds chart. We've got one linked on our blog if you'd like to color along with us. All you need is that chart and a purple, yellow, red, green, and blue crayon. If that's not tickling your fancy right now, you can just listen and make a mental image in your math's mind. Here we go. The number one only had one factor, one. So we knew it was a bit of an oddball. Therefore, we colored it purple. Then we circled the number two with our pencil. Do not color the number two. It's special. Remember, we could only draw one rectangle for two. We colored all the multiples of two yellow. Next, we circled the number three. Do not color the number three. It's special because it only had one rectangle. Then we colored the multiples of 3 red. Some of the numbers like 6 and 12 were already colored, so we just left them alone. I mean, why mess with a good thing? And kept searching for uncolored multiples. There were a total of 16 squares colored red. Then we circled 5 with our pencil. Do not color 5. It's special. Again, it only had one rectangle. Are you catching a pattern? Can you guess what we did next? We colored all the multiples of 5, blue. There were only five blue squares. Next, we circled the number seven. Do not color numbers that can only be drawn with one rectangle, but do color the multiples of seven green. There were only three green squares. Count them up, 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 count them up, 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 we're on fire! Only 25 of the numbers from one through 100 were left uncolored, including two, three, five, and seven. If you counted all of them, then you sifted out all the prime numbers under 100. You just use mathematics that's over 2,000 years old. Eratosthenes would be so proud. If you're wondering what the numbers that aren't prime are called, the ones that were multiples of 2, 3, 5, and 7, they're called composite. 
because they're composed of more than two factors. We found the treasure, but we couldn't exactly take the time to make a sieve every time we wanted to find a prime number. Nobody's got time for that. We still had other subjects to learn. While we liked the visual, we needed to develop a shortcut. A shortcut that made number sense. That's when I introduced the divisibility challenge. Students would write the number they were investigating on their paper and underline it. Under this line, they would write two, three, five, seven. We made our own little jingle. Two, three, five, seven, call prime. We called up every time we wanted to see if we should classify a number as prime or composite. We typed the underlined number in our calculator and divided it by two. This is what we've learned before. If the number is even, then I know it is divisible by two. I don't even have to use my calculator. I can just check the digit in the ones place. If the number we were classifying was divisible by two, we'd give it a check mark next to the two. The check meant two was a factor, which meant the number was composite. If two wasn't a factor, we kept on dividing, crossing our fingers that we'd find some prime treasure. Next, we'd take our number under investigation and divide by three. If three was a factor, then yup, you guessed it, it was composite. We didn't even have to keep dividing. If it wasn't a factor, meaning it didn't divide evenly, you could tell it didn't divide evenly because there'd be some digits after the decimal. We keep on dividing. We check the numbers divisibility by five and by seven. If none of those first four prime numbers were a factor, we knew we'd done it again. We'd found a prime number less than 100. See, what makes a prime number prime is that it has exactly two, I repeat, exactly two factors, one and itself. If you can divide it by another number, that means that number is also a factor, which means it has more than two factors, which also means it is composite. One check on our divisibility challenge helped us to classify the number as composite. Four X is marked that number as prime treasure. Conjectures started popping up. A conjecture is basically like a hypothesis in math. Well, this divisibility strategy using 2357 to find prime numbers always work? You know, the strategy where we check the divisibility of the number by 2357 to classify a number as prime or composite? I mean, our strategy is just a shortcut of the ancient sieve that Eratosthenes gifted us. And it works great for numbers less than 100. It actually works all the way until 121. 121 is not divisible by 2, 3, 5, or 7. But it is divisible by 11. So it is a composite number. It would fail our test. To be certain about large numbers, we need to see if it's divisible by any prime number that is less than half of that number. Our prime treasure hunt this year is limited to the numbers 1 through 100. So, 2, 3, 5, 7, call prime. There you have it. We discovered three ways to classify numbers, natural or not natural, even or odd, and prime or composite. I wonder if there are even more ways to classify numbers. Spoiler alert, there are. But you'll need to wait until next year to learn that. Good thing I picked that mic back up because it's time to drop it again. woo Now it's time to meet the real stars of the show, the terms you've all been waiting for, my personal close friends, Prime and Composite. Bonjour, I'm a Prime number. Uh, hello, I'm a Composite number. Thank you for having me on your podcast today. I'm Prime and I just love to be in the spotlight. I'm really a special type of number, you know. What makes me so special? I am a number that has exactly two factors. The only factors that can make me are one and myself. Sometimes people think zero and one are prime, but they aren't. And I hate when people say that. Ugh, they only have one factor, themselves. Please try to be kind and remember that I have exactly two factors. Some examples of me are 2, 3, 5, 7, 23, 29, and 31. But I can be much larger numbers, too. Ugh. 
Enough already, Prime. We all know how special you are. We get it. Composite numbers are important, too. After all, most numbers are composite. If you find a number that has more than two factors, then you know you found me, Mr. Composite. I get irritated with zero and one. They're not composite or prime. Lots of numbers are composite. All even numbers other than two are composite. Some examples of me, Mr. Composite, are four, eight, and ten. A lot of bigger numbers are composite, too. I feel so honored to have been on this podcast. I haven't been this famous since Eustace Siv. If you try to find me, just look for the numbers with exactly two factors. I'll be there. All the other n- numbers that have more than two factors, they're composite. Thanks, Prime and Composite. We're so glad you could make it here today. Now, this may be a mass podcast, but our class is full of readers, too. Take a listen to two books we recommend from this unit. Hi, my name is Tucker, and I want to tell you about a book we read in class. The book is called Being 13 by Matthew McElligott. In the book, they explore even and odd numbers. It had great illustrations, and it was funny because the grasshoppers refused to eat odd numbers. And it helped me review what it means to be even and odd. Hi, mathematicians. My name is Mina, and have I got a book for you. We read the book Missing Mittens by Stuart J. Murphy. In this book, animals are wearing mittens for some reason, and Farmer Bill couldn't find them all because someone or something was taking them. This book was really helpful for me when I was learning about evens and odds because there were pictures that showed pairs throughout the book. It wasn't that funny, but it was a good mystery. You should check it out. Thanks for the book recommendations, Mina and Tucker. Now, here's a cool fact about prime numbers for the road. Did you know that the largest known prime number is 24,862,048 digits long? If we were to print that one number in a book, it would take 8,287 pages. That's longer than all of the Harry Potter books combined. Mathematicians have proven there's an infinite number of prime numbers, but there is no pattern for prime numbers so they are constantly searching for the next one. There will always be a larger prime number than the largest one we know, and there will always be a mathematician trying to find it. What we do know is that we all have maths brains, and there is no limit to what you can do. I can classify prime numbers less than or equal to 100. I can classify composite numbers less than or equal to 100. I can describe whether a number is prime or composite. I can demonstrate with models or pictures why a number is prime or composite. I can categorize numbers as even or odd. I can demonstrate with manipulatives or pictures why a number is even or odd. I can describe whether a number is even or odd. I can demonstrate with models or pictures why all the sum or difference of two numbers is even or odd. This podcast was brought to you by the words of Sarah Adams. Everyday love, changing everyday lives.